Good morning. First, I'd like to uh, say how pleased I am to see that your involvement in this course has really improved over the past week. Uh, reading and following the various discussion threads has been really interesting to me, and particularly seeing how uh, many of you have uh, gone well beyond the minimum in terms of your comments and your responses. Uh, it's great. It's very gratifying and it makes the uh, conversations in the discussion board much more lively. Also pleased to see that just about everyone has handed in a web paper for this past week. And I hope that now that you know what's expected, uh, you'll continue to do that and you'll find the websites that you're going to very enjoyable and interesting. Well, this week you are reading about prenatal development, uh, both um, the kinds of changes that take place as a, an embryo and fetus develops in a healthy and normal way, as well as looking at a number of different kinds of teratogens, that is, those kinds of agents that can cause adverse effects on growth and development. But first, I'd like to focus on something that's brought up at the beginning of your chapter and encourage you to think about issues of family planning, about why people have children, about what kinds of things influence family size. Now, many of you have had children, and in many of your comments on the discussion board, uh, you've tended to see this as a personal issue. Uh, it shouldn't involve governments or other social policies. But in fact, um, the reasons that people have children and the number of children that they have is affected by all kinds of social and economic forces uh, within societies. Uh, just as an example, uh, Japan, which uh, uh, is one of the most economically advanced and stable countries in the world, uh, is expected to lose about 20% of its population by the year 2050. Currently it has uh, a little bit over uh, 120 million people and in your lifetimes it will be down to under 100 million. At the same time, a country like Brazil, which has about 175 million people, uh, is expected to increase its population uh, by about another 50 million or more people by the year 2050. Population growth can affect economic vitality directly. In the case of Japan, the Japanese are worried that as their population declines, there will be fewer workers to maintain the standard of living that the Japanese have come to expect. And in the case of Brazil, a, a country in which half of the uh, population is under age 20, the fear is that large numbers of children will um, undermine the kinds of economic growth that would help improve the quality of life for all Brazilians. Well, the problems of Brazil and Japan are not uh, unique uh, throughout much of Europe, for example. Uh, countries like Italy, France, uh, Spain, uh, the Scandinavian countries. Uh, lower population growth is associated with uh, concerns about uh, the ability to maintain uh, future economic growth. And when you look at European countries, uh, they have manage that so far by increasing the number of workers uh, who are immigrants from the Middle East, uh, from the Far East, and from Africa. Even in the United States, uh, where estimates are that our population will take about 90 years to double, uh, the population of Mexico uh, will increase by 30 percent in the next 45 years. I remember years ago uh, when I had my first child, uh, rather late, um, I was about 39 at the time, and I read a statistic that stayed with me ever since. The population of the world at that time was uh, five and a half to six million people, and the world estimate of population growth was at that time that the world's population would double in the next 39 years. And it made me think that here I was at 39, and when my son became 39 himself, there would be twice as many people in the world. And what was that world going to be like that he was going to be a part of? The individual decisions that we make and the reasons that we make them affect uh, global interactions, uh, everything from, as I say, economics uh, to politics to even warfare. 
Uh, for example, uh, not only uh, when you have a large population of children will they become a large population of childbearing age, but wars are mostly fought by younger people. And when you look at uh, countries in which there is both large unemployment and large numbers of 15 to 25 year old men, you see parts of the country that are more vulnerable to warfare and violence. I'll give you one other example, um, kind of at the end of the prenatal period in effect, and that's infant mortality. There are many different reasons uh, for uh, death in the first year, and most of them are manageable. Uh, but just to give you a perspective on this, it's not surprising that 22 of the 25 countries that have infant mortality rates of more than 100 deaths per thousand births, that's more than 10% of infants dying in the first year, are African countries. It's also not surprising that of those 25 countries that make up the lowest infant mortality rates in the world, uh, that they all come from highly developed modern countries either of Europe or of Asia. Uh, interestingly, the infant mortality rate in the United States, which I'll tell you the number of in a minute, doesn't even put us in the top 25 in the world today. Uh, that infant mortality rate, by the way, is between six and seven deaths per thousand, which is not bad when you think of it. Uh, even within the United States, however, the infant mortality rate for, say, African Americans uh, runs about twice that of the white population. To give you a slightly different perspective, uh, the infant mortality rate in a country like Japan is about half of that of the United States. If you went back a century, say to 1900, you would find that the infant mortality rate at that time in the United States was about 135 per thousand births, about 13.5%, roughly equal to what you find in the worst of the countries in the African continent that I mentioned just a moment ago. Now one goal of a healthy society certainly is to lower infant mortality rate, to uh, improve the quality of pregnancy and the quality of life early in a child's life. And so you have these two things balancing against each other in a way, that as infant mortality rates decline, as maternal health improves during pregnancy, the short-term outcome is more accelerated growth of populations. And yet, at, at the same time, as people can expect that their children will survive pregnancy uh, and the first year or two of life, their overall population size, that is the number of children that they choose to have, typically declines. Well, there are a number of interrelated uh, both uh, micro and macro kinds of issues related to family planning, but uh, I'll leave them for now and just encourage you to try to learn more about this as you understand not just your own personal decisions, but how those decisions are being made by the now over six and a half billion people in the world. When you look at um, the prenatal period of time, there's a couple interesting things I wanted to highlight. First of all, it's the shortest uh, period of childhood, roughly nine months as you know, about 38 weeks. And yet it's a period uh, which has incredible long-term potential effects for better or for worse. You start out with that conceived ovum, that zygote of one cell, and you end up at birth with a baby uh, of some 12 trillion cells. And so both quantitatively in terms of the number of cells being grown and qualitatively, that is, what those cells combined allow us to become, becoming an organism that can live independently, there's an incredible amount going on. One of the things I wanted to point out was that each of the prenatal stages, the zygotic stage, embryonic, and fetal periods, have unique kinds of growth that are important for healthy development. You might notice, for example, that in the embryonic period, uh, roughly from the second week of pregnancy through the eighth, all of the organ systems 
that will eventually be able to support us uh, come into being. And that some of the teratogens that impact early in a pregnancy can cause profound distortions of growth. Uh, rubella mentioned in your book, which uh, is a virus that can produce uh, offspring or children who have uh, blindness, um, deafness, heart abnormalities uh, in about 25 to 50 percent of cases uh, where the mother has been exposed early in a pregnancy. That would be an example. Another example would be, uh, for instance, uh, something like uh, uh, mercury or lead, a teratogen found, uh, teratogens found throughout um, a variety of environmental sources, which can directly affect development of the brain and nervous system. Uh, some teratogens uh, produce risks uh, commonly things like low birth weight, for example, uh, or uh, prematurity in terms of uh, when a baby is born. Uh, but those risks are in some ways relatively minor. For example, um, on a scale of numbers, uh, probably cigarette smoking continues to be the most widely exposed teratogen to for embryos and fetuses. Uh, between maybe 12 and as high as 25 percent of all mothers smoke during a pregnancy. And the general rule of thumb is that uh, for mothers who smoke about uh, a pack of cigarettes a day, they can expect that their baby will weigh uh, as much as a half a pound less than a mother who has not been exposed to cigarettes. Others that are fairly common, for instance, uh, uh, alcohol. Uh, your text mentions both fetal alcohol syndrome and more milder fetal alcohol effects. Not so much the quantity of alcohol, but the timing of exposure and uh, uh, early as opposed to later in a pregnancy uh, that can have uh, impacts. Uh, nonetheless, uh, as many as 40,000 babies a year are born with effects of alcohol exposure from their mothers. That's about 1% of pregnancies. Many of the things that can affect pregnancy uh, are things that we don't even think about. They may be common over-the-counter drugs like uh, uh, aspirin or tetracycline. Or they may be things we're not even aware of like uh, a parasite like uh, uh, toxoplasmosis. There's a parasite that is transmitted through food or in some cases through uh, kitty litter um, through the feces of cats. And uh, uh, it can have serious effects on developing uh, embryos and fetuses. Now the fact that uh, over a third of all pregnant women show antibodies to toxoplasmosis is not something that's that well known. And yet in half the cases of women who have toxoplasmosis antibodies, they pass on some of those effects to the developing embryo and fetus. Well, I'm not trying to scare you. Uh, there are uh, a lot of things that one could be exposed to. I think it's good to keep in mind that uh, uh, between 90 and 95 percent of babies born in this country are born uh, healthy and pretty much full term. But when you look around the world and you look at the higher infant mortality rates that I mentioned a moment ago, uh, I guess the silver lining is that most of the causes of those problems are not exotic or strange illnesses or diseases, but rather the kinds of uh, sources of teratogens, uh, poor drinking water, poor nutrition, uh, vaccination against illnesses that have improved the quality of life, life in the developed world dramatically. Again, just to give you one other example um, of this, uh, maybe from the other end of the lifespan, um, the average life expectancy in a country like Japan today, the average Japanese citizen, lives to be over 80 years of age. Uh, in Brazil, the average life expectancy of its citizens is about 63 years of age. So there's quite a difference there. And again, when you look at the United States, uh, at the turn of the last century, at 1900, when we had such a high infant mortality rate, our average life expectancy was slightly under 50. By the end of the last century, the year 2000, 
Americans could expect to live to be about 75, a 50% increase in a fairly short period of history. Uh, I mentioned African Americans as having higher infant mortality rates, and just as an aside here, I'll mention as well that the average life expectancy of African Americans trails that of white Americans by about 10 years. So the cumulative effects, not just of prenatal issues, but those that continue right through the lifespan, can cause real differences in the quality of life and the quantity of life for citizens. Uh, I wanted to point out one other area before we um, end today. Uh, this chapter, as I say, focuses on uh, various things that can adversely affect a pregnancy. But in fact, many things can help to, if not ensure a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby, certainly increase its likelihood. So I thought I'd end on the positive a little bit. First of all, good nutrition, good maternal nutrition, starting even before one becomes pregnant, can have a, a direct effect on the health of the developing embryo and fetus. Uh, average weight gains uh, recommended, for example, for pregnant women uh, are about 25 to 30 pounds. Uh, and uh, uh, women who gain much more than that or much less than that increase different kinds of risks, both to themselves and to their uh, children. Uh, increasing proteins, increasing B vitamins, increasing overall calories uh, can all be effective in uh, optimizing growth during pregnancy. If I were to think of one thing when you look both in the United States and worldwide that is associated with a healthier pregnancy, a shorter labor, fewer birth complications, and healthier children in the first year, uh, it's a correlation uh, that I'll just pass along with you and that is uh, beginning uh, to have prenatal care with a physician very early on. Uh, when you look at countries like Japan, uh, whose infant mortality rate, as I said, is half that of the United States, or when you look at the United States, whose infant mortality rate is one-sixth of that of Brazil, Brazil is about 37 per thousand births, what you find is that healthy pregnancy and healthy childbirth are strongly correlated with uh, regular maternal visits to um, an obstetrician. Probably several reasons for this. Uh, you, most of us don't know what to expect and physicians do. Uh, we can find out things sooner if there's some change that has to be made and we can do things about it that will increase the likelihood of health uh, for our children. Even in the United States when you look at minorities uh, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, uh, Asian Americans, whose birth rates, by the way, are all higher than that of white Americans, what you find is that the likelihood that they will, those minority population groups will go see a physician on a regular basis during their pregnancies is considerably lower. So if I were to think of at least one social policy uh, recommendation for this country as well as for others, it would be to increase the availability of uh, prenatal care for pregnant uh, women and their partners and to make that not just available and low cost but to encourage it uh, as one of the uh, easiest ways to uh, lead to a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby. Well next week we'll be talking about labor and delivery. Some of you have been there and you know what it's like uh, and we'll also be talking about uh, what babies look like when they are born and when they come out of the womb. So uh, enjoy your readings this week. Uh, I look forward to following your discussion uh, on the discussion board and reading your papers. See you then.